Good morning. It is always a blessing to be here. Uh, go ahead and open up to John chapter 6. If you thought we were done with this chapter, think again. We are still there. And uh, this is, I think, the fourth, fourth sermon on at least the second half of the, of the chapter here. This is a long one. This is the longest chapter in the Gospel of John. And uh, I hope you're getting familiar with it. Uh, this is a really, uh, a very precious text. John chapter 6. So again, I hope you're, you're getting familiar with it. Um, Brad spent at least, I think, the last three weeks talking about uh, the sovereignty of God as taught by Christ. In this chapter, we, uh, we emphasize God's effectual call in verse 37, where Christ says that all that the Father will gives to the Son will come. There's not, a, there's not a might. There's no probability of failure there. We saw man's natural inability to come to Christ in verse Verse 44, Jesus says, none can come to me unless he's drawn by the Father. And then we looked at how God's salvation is perfect in that all who are drawn, all who are given, will come and will be raised on the last day. There's no chance that God is going to save his people. And this is uh, just a, a beautiful and an encouraging text. After that, we had looked at how the Jews at that time objected to this teaching. They didn't like it. There's, a, there's really kind of a debate that goes up. The last two sermons, we looked at objections to this, and we saw that every time they would raise these objections, we don't like this teaching, Jesus would double down. He wouldn't, he wouldn't back down, he would double down. And uh, today we're going to continue in the same text, but we're going to look primarily at two things. We are going to look at the means of God's sovereign salvation, and we are going to look at the identity of Christ. And really, these two things are, are kind of different sides of the same coin, is correctly identifying Christ is inseparable from God's means of salvation. Um, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and read through this text here, starting in verse 22. It says, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I, said, I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? 
How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is, too, is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread your fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So the first thing we're going to focus on here is the concept of bread. One of, the, one of the first questions I ask to my wife when we talk throughout the day or after I get out of work is, hey, what are we having for dinner? And, uh, you know, because there's options, right? It, it, has she cooked something? Does she want me to grill when I get home? Do I want to pick something up on my way home? And if I do, what do we want? Do we want Mexican? Do we want Chinese? We have a lot of options. And I point that out just because in the context of first century Palestine, they didn't really have options. There was not really a question of what are we going to have for dinner. It was pretty much bread and fish. Um, that was just kind of what you ate. And, and really, that's been the case for the majority of human history. Depending on what uh, geographical area you're talking about, there's primarily one or two things that people would eat. And they would eat the same thing pretty much every day. They were uh, staple foods of the culture. So bread has a certain significance to it in this context. Uh, another thing that's interesting that'll, that'll come up later is that it's estimated that in Palestine in the first century, for the average person, about 85% of their wages would go towards food. So if you, if you know my family, we have, we have a lot of kids. So on groceries, we spend a lot, uh, but we don't spend 85% of our, of our income on food. Again, that'll, that'll come up later. That's important. Um, and, and again here, bread is, uh, just has this massive significance to it. Bread is, is food. Food is what the body needs to live. Without bread, without food, you're going to die. You're not going to live very long if you, if you stop eating. Um, let, let's look here at the theme of bread throughout, uh, throughout this text here. We have, uh, well, verse 26 here. Jesus points out the motive of the crowd that was following him. He says, basically, you're just here because I fed you. You wanted the bread that I offered. You want what I can give you, but you don't want me. That's, that's why you're here. That's why you're following me. They saw Jesus as someone who is useful to them. And actually, before this, if, if you recall, leading up to this was the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and the people wanted to crown him king. And here the people are following, and they're, they're doing these good things, but they're doing that with the wrong motive. They saw Jesus as useful. They said, hey, here's someone who can give us bread so we don't have to spend 85% of our money on eating. It was useful to them. Verse 27, we see Jesus start to make this theological point here, and he says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So again here, that's kind of where the 85% comes in. You're, you're working for food. That's, that was just what you did. You would work to eat. So he's saying, don't, don't work for this kind of food. Work for something else. Don't get, so, don't get so caught up, in other words, in feeding yourself physically that you neglect to feed yourself spiritually. 
verse 30, he continues kind of exposing their heart. He points out, you've, you've seen a great miracle, you know, and I, I fed you, but, but they wanted another one to believe. So in other words, they had just seen this great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And, uh, and they said, well, yeah, we, we saw that miracle, but do it again, and then we'll believe. And, uh, and this kicks off kind of a back and forth in the dialogue here, their rejection of Christ, their offense at what he was saying. And, and every time they uh, showed offense, Jesus would, would just double down. Uh, the, the offensive things that he was teaching there primarily uh, were, were two things. One, were, one was that God is sovereign. And again, um, Brad unpacked those in his last, uh, last three or so sermons. And then the other thing that they found very offensive was the exclusivity or the correct identity of Christ. And that's going to be my focus today here. Uh, namely, that Jesus is the bread of life and that there is no life, there is no relationship with the Father apart from the Son, apart from Him. In verse 31 here, they, uh, they kind of bring the, the discussion in a more theological context. They say, oh, well, yeah, we know about the bread of God. Our fathers ate that. Our fathers ate the bread that Moses gave them in the wilderness. And, and we remember how God had delivered Israel from the hand of Egypt. And then uh, after that, he provided for them by giving them literally daily bread. There was bread that would, would fall from the sky, this manna. Uh, that's Exodus 16, if you, need a, if you need a refresher. And the people would go out in the morning and they would collect some kind of bread that would come down. So, so the people are saying here, hey, yeah, we know all about that. We know the story. We know about the bread. Our memory's good and our theology's good too. And then in the next verse, Jesus corrects their theology. And he says, well, actually, it, it wasn't Moses that gave you that. It was God. And he says, the true bread of God gives life to the world, not just Israel, to the world, and that bread is me. He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the one who gives life to the world, and without me, there is no life. Next several verses, the, they continue objecting. Christ continues doubling down. And then uh, starting in verse 49 here, Christ will really kind of contrast these types of bread says, the bread from God that you were thinking of was actually just a picture. It was a type of me. It was a sign of what's to come. It was to point to something greater. That was what the purpose of the manna in the wilderness was. Jesus says, I am the manna. I'm the fulfillment of that. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. And unlike the bread in the wilderness that had to be collected daily, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Verse 53 says, because they were disputing, uh, he gets really explicit, and then he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And continuing to contrast himself with the bread they ate in Moses' time, again, to eat the, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to live forever. It's not, a, it's not something that you need to go and work for daily. So we see here, really, the first, the first point here is that bread is the sustenance of life. And Jesus is, is obviously on a different wavelength than his audience. They are thinking physically, he is speaking spiritually. They are thinking temporally, he is speaking eternally. But we get the point. Just like bread is required for physical life, so is Christ required for spiritual life. The next point here is that Christ is not only the giver, but he is himself the gift. Uh, in the first 15 verses, again here, we, we looked at the, the breaking of the bread for the 5,000. We see in that that Christ was the one who gave them that bread. And then here we see that not only is he the giver, he is the gift. And th this is, I think, one way of equating and connecting Jesus with the Father. The Father gave them bread in the wilderness thousands of years ago. Now, today, the Son gives them bread. And Jesus' multiplication of the bread for the Jews earlier in the chapter is a shadow of what he would do on the cross. Or the cross, he would give his body to the many. So not only is he the giver, but he is the gift. And without him, we're, we're spiritually dead. And, and he really drives this point home four times, both, both Jesus and John. It's, it's four times repeated in this, this little chunk of scripture where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and without me there is no life. Four times it says that. 
Jesus is the embodiment of God's provision for his people. It's also interesting that we see kind of contrasting contrasting and comparing the time of Moses with the time of Christ. We see that the bread has a a semblance of of judgment to it there. Looking back, back in the day of Moses, uh, I'll read Psalm uh, 78, 21 here. This This is a passage that's looking back on Moses recording this, and it says, God provided manna for Israel and struck dead those who took his gracious gift while rebelling against him. So if you remember, the generation that God provided the manna for uh, was not the ideal generation. In fact, many of them were judged. They didn't see the promised land uh, due to their rejection, their rebellion against God. And, and so here in this context with Christ in the first century, these guys who are, who are talking about, oh yeah, our fathers ate that. Our fathers followed God. But like their fathers, they wanted the blessings of God, but they didn't want God. So like the generation that rebelled against Moses, uh, so the generation of Jesus rejected him. Next point is that bread also symbolizes a reversal of the curse to a degree. Um, I love doing word studies and preparing for this sermon. I uh, came to realize that the first place in scripture that bread is mentioned is actually Genesis 3, Genesis 3, 19, where God is giving the curse following Adam's sin. And God says this, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till, till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. So part of what's wrapped up in the curse here is that our sustenance, our bread, comes from our work. Again, 85% of, of the income of, of someone who would, who would hear this would go towards that. So it's very real, the connection between work and bread. And from a physical standpoint, again, we, we have to work to eat, we have to, to work to provide for our families, thanks to Uh, modern technology and and things like that. We don't have to work probably as hard as generations of the past in order to to get those things. Uh, But the principle still stands. If we don't eat, we will eventually die. If we don't work, we won't eat. It's a a pretty simple concept. And where we we come to this, this sermon point here is that the whole idea of working for what is due us is contrasted by Christ and by the teaching of sovereign grace. Christ is the true bread that we receive, not through our works, not through the sweat of our brow, not through what we do, but it's God's gift of grace. It's something that's freely bestowed upon us. Rather than working for what is due to us, the gospel is is Christ taking on human flesh, living perfectly as a man, doing these works, doing the good works and suffering the punishment that is due to us. So rather than us getting what, what we are due, Jesus took what was due to us. And in exchange, we get what he earned. And on the back end here, if you think, and, and many professing Christians do think this, if you think that God owes you eternal life or that you've worked hard enough to earn salvation, I assure you, you don't understand the gospel. Salvation is not a result of what you do for God, but is a result of what God has done for you. And belief, belief is the means through which God saves his people. So bread, then Christ is the bread of life. Christ is the bread who came down from heaven. This, among other things, symbolizes a reversal of the curse. Next thing we're going to look at is Christology. Christology. So we're going to look at what Jesus said about himself. There's uh, unfortunately more controversy than there should should be around this. And uh, this is one of those topics that um, there's a lot of people out there who would profess the name of Christ who would give different weight to different things in Scripture. So there are people, even at relatively conservative theological schools and Bible colleges and things like that that contrast Christ and Paul. 
as if, okay, well, Christ is over here saying this. Really, we follow him. Christ followed him too, but, you know, where, where maybe there's, there's no apparent harmony between Christ and Paul, well, we stick with what Jesus said. Um, and this is not, uh, not a good method of doing that, as we know that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's all the Word of Christ. There's no, ultimately, there is no red-letter Bible in that Jesus' words trump what God has spoken elsewhere. But we're going to look specifically here at, at Christology, at what Christ said about himself. And this statement here, when Christ says, I am the bread of life, this actually kicks off one of seven, how perfect is that, seven different statements um, that Christ says throughout the Gospel of John, seven different I am statements, uh, where Christ is speaking of who he is, of what his identity is. And this one, again, is, is the first of seven. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Again, four different times this passage says that. And, and, and the point here, again, we just talked about bread. As bread sustains our physical life, Christ offers and sustains spiritual life. Uh, the next one's coming in, in John chapter 8. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. To a world lost in darkness, Christ offers himself as the guide. In John 10, he says, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus protects his followers as a, as a shepherd protects their flocks from predators. And then a few verses later, he says, I, also in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. Again, he's committed to caring and to watching over and protecting and to keeping those who are his. John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Death is not the final word for those who are in Christ. John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the source of all truth, all knowledge about God. And then the seventh in John 15, he says, I am the true vine. Being attached to Christ, his life flows through us as we, we bear fruit as we abide in him. So Jesus was not confused about who he was. He wasn't... Uh, as some of the some of the theories go, he wasn't just a just a normal guy who his later followers you know made into someone special, right? He he wasn't someone who uh, people started thinking was was God incarnate at, at the Council of Nicaea or some ridiculous thing like that. We we can see here when we look at what Jesus says about himself, we can see pretty clearly uh, how important that is. And this is just from the from the I am statements there. Again, the the rest of these I'm sure we'll unpack as we continue through through the gospel here. But the next thing that Christ says about himself in this text here, we see that Christ is incarnate, that Christ is pre-existent. It says verse, uh, verse 41 and 51, he says, I came down from heaven. Uh, and this is what, what John had already laid out in the prologue of the gospel uh, in John chapter 1 here, when he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Christ had no beginning. Christ's, Christ's existence did not start in Bethlehem. Christ existed prior to that. He has no beginning. And though he is God, he is distinct from the Father. And this is, of course, uh, part of the teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus is God, but he's not the Father. We also see this, this connection, this, this oneness with the Father he has here. Look at Verse 45, essentially what he's saying is, all of, all of the true people of God follow me. If, if, you, if you listen to God and you followed him rightly, you would be following me, but you're not. There's a, a consistency there. The teaching of God is the teaching of Christ. Next point in, in verse 54 here, we see the introduction of the blood. This, of course, pointing to a blood sacrifice, another wildly unpopular teaching in our time and place. We see the necessity of Christ's atoning death. His life ultimately would be of no benefit to us if it were not for his death. His, his, life, his life has positive benefits to us. Um, it's, it's in his life that he perfectly kept the law of God, and that's credited to us. But on the flip side, that, that would be of, of nothing to us if he didn't die for us, if he didn't die to, uh, for, for our justification, if he didn't die to cancel the legal debt that we owe to God for our sin. Uh, 
Another thing that I think we're, we're kind of disconnected from, from this audience is, you know, if you would ask mo most kids, I think, you know, where does food come from today? Most of them would, would probably say the grocery store or, or something like that. And um, that, that's just kind of how we think. We, for the most part, probably don't think that, um, that critically about where our food comes from. So here, here's an interesting connection is that for you to eat, for you to live, something must die. Uh, whether you're eating a, a cheeseburger and the cow has to die in order for you to eat, or whether you're just eating bread, the wheat has to eat, or uh, the, the, fish, uh, the fish has to die so we can eat, there's this, there's this exchange that happens just throughout life in general. For us to live, something else must die. And this, of course, points to Christ. You see where I'm going with this. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 and Leviticus 17 tell us that Without the shedding, is, the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Again, going back to the atonement. We could not be forgiven our, of our sins had Christ not suffered and died and spilled his blood for us. So we're the ones who deserve to have our blood shed for our sin. But in the gospel, Christ had his blood shed on our behalf. Move to... Well, yeah, we'll move to a couple points of, of application here. So, again, the, the primary things that, that we're talking about here are God's means of salvation and the identity of Christ. And, and as we see throughout this, these things are, are really inseparable. Um, part of salvation is, is rightly knowing and identifying Christ. So the, the, first, the first point of application here is to believe in Christ. Uh, verse, verse 29 here, again, Jesus says the, the work of God is to believe in the one whom he has sent. Or another translation says the work God wants from you is to believe. So as we expound the scriptures, we are learning who he is, and the, and the purpose of that is so we may believe in him. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the preexistent son. I am the necessary blood sacrifice. Our rightful response is to believe in him as he presents himself in scriptures. So in his, in his context back here with these, these unbelieving Jews, there was a certain sense that in which they believed in him, right? They believed that he could continue to do more miracles. They, could, they believed that he could give them food. They believed that he could give them what they wanted to a certain degree, uh, but they didn't believe in him as he identified himself, why it's so important to not only believe in Christ, but believe in Christ as he presents himself and as scripture presents Christ. Next point is from verse 37, and that is come to Christ. Very similar to the last point of believing in Christ, to come to Christ. We come to Christ, but not in the same way that his unbelieving audience did. His unbelieving audience came so that he could give them something. They came so that they could see miracles and um, <laughs> they came for food but they had they had the wrong motive verse 37 says all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me i will never cast out so this is important of, of not only coming to christ but coming to christ with the right motive furthermore to come to christ implies that we have to leave something. We have to leave somewhere to come to Christ. We have to let go of something in order to come to Christ. We must let go of the world to grab onto Christ. Christ is not simply an addition to our lives, not something we, we don't bring him and, and bring him into to whatever we're doing. No, we, we leave what we're doing and we come to him. We must come to him and he must be our everything. Last point of application here, verse 54 and 55, to eat and drink Christ. He says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Christ is more precious than temporal food. He's more precious than temporal health. He's more precious than a good retirement or whatever else we're seeking. And, and so then that 
begs the question, not begs the question, but that raises the question of how. How do we eat and drink Christ? And I think there's, there's two different ways here, but one of them we've already kind of answered with the last two points of application. Um, by, by believing and coming, we eat and drink Christ. But we have uh, two, two points on this here. So there's the picture and there's the substance. Uh, the picture of eating and drinking Christ, like we were talking about in the catechism question for the kids, there's baptism and the Lord's Supper are pictures of things. They're ordinances that, that Christ has given us. Um, so in the Lord's Supper, which is not initiated yet, Jesus will, will go on to initiate the Lord's Supper later, we look back on that that Passover looked forward to. Um, it's, it's something that's ordained by Christ. It's, it's a means of grace, taking the Lord's Supper, and it's, it's a picture of the cross. We take, we take in the Lord's Supper or communion as a symbol, as a reminder of what Christ has done. So this is one way, but again, this is just the picture of how we do that. The actual substance of, of how we do that is by looking to God's means of salvation. Again, by believing, by coming to Christ. This is, this is, how, we, this is how we eat the, the flesh of Christ and drink the blood of Christ, is by believing and coming to him. We believe that Jesus put on human flesh. He lived a perfect substitutionary life, and he died a perfect substitutionary death. And our response then is to come to him in faith. We believe in who he said he was. We trust in him. We submit to him. And in this way, we partake in eating the bread of life. Father, I thank you so much for, um, for your word. I thank you for sending your son. I thank you for the body and the blood of Christ. I thank you that this is not something that we work towards, but something that you give us freely, that you, that you bless us with. Thank you for your grace, Father. Lord, use us to, use us to reach your sheep. Use us to, to bring your people. Lord, help us to honor you with our lives. And all that we do, Lord, we pray that not for, not for our glory, but for yours. And we pray that we would just, we would praise you and we would glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.